I know we are a bit late in releasing this Parsha podcast. I think this is the first time this year, the seventh year of the Parsha podcast, that we are not releasing the Parsha podcast on Wednesday night. And instead, we are releasing it on Thursday. And the reason for that is because today, when I'm speaking to you, it's Thursday evening. And why did I not release it earlier? Well, here's the reason. This was a crazy week. On Sunday, with the help of the Almighty, we recorded the 16th and final episode of the Messiah series on the Torah 101 podcast channel. If you're not listening, you're missing. I have to say, it's a total masterpiece, a comprehensive study of the subject of Messiah. If you haven't listened to it, give it a listen. Torah 101, the number 101. That was on Sunday. Then Sunday afternoon, we went on this trip in the Northeast the whole day. We came back late at night. Monday, we were preparing for our trip back home. And then on Tuesday and Wednesday, I drove more than 800 miles each one of those days, like 13 hours of driving. I would not recommend it. If you have maybe other options, maybe consider that. But thank God we arrived safely late last night on Wednesday night. And as you might imagine, sitting on the interstate with some crutchy kids in the vehicle, it's probably not the ideal setting for preparing for a Parsha podcast. But thank God with the help of the Almighty this morning, I was able to iron out what I wanted to talk about. I think it's very good. You may say, well, you know, less preparation might not be as good. It might be a little bit underbaked. Let me know what you think. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. Now, as I mentioned last time and the time beforehand, this is Torch Podcast Improvement Month. That's the month of August. Every month we have something. We have Black History Month and Native American History Month and Italian and Asian and Jewish and uh, Ep- Epilepsy Awareness Month. At Torch, we have a month that we're trying to improve, trying to get better at our craft, at our podcasts. And uh, part of that is that we prepared a survey for you, the listening audience, to chime in. Give us your take, what you like, what you want to hear more of, what you want to hear less of, the formats, everything. And that survey, you could find it in the description or at torchsurvey.com. Now, Parsha Shoftim... It talks about a great many things, including in the subject matters of Parshas Shoftim, is the instructions regarding the conquest of Canaan. The Jewish people are on the doorstep. They are on the precipice of Canaan. They are on the other side of the Jordan. Of course, Moshe will pass before they cross over the Jordan, but it's a couple of weeks away. And the nation is told what they need to do, how they need to relate to their foes lying on the east of the Jordan River. And they're told that when you encounter a city, you have to reach out peacefully, offer terms. And as we shall see, Joshua did that. But if they respond with bellicosity, you must wage war. And we're told not to be merciful, not to be too docile, or else we would get destroyed. You know, the Jewish people were not natural warriors, at least not of the physical kind. And we need to be trained in the awful ways of war. And we're told how should the nations, the seven Canaanite nations, should they refuse the terms that we offer them? We must eliminate those indigenous peoples. We must get rid of the seven Canaanite nations. And the verse tells us that the reason why This is chapter 20, verse 18. In order that they not teach us to behave as they do, to mimic all their abominable ways, because then we will be sinful to Hashem our God. If they stick around, then they will invariably teach us how to behave and will adopt all their abominable ways. And they engage in all sorts of deviant behavior. Of course, the the pagan idolatry is one thing, but also human sacrifice, child sacrifice. These are people that are completely incompatible with God and with the land. And therefore, they cannot remain in the land and they cannot remain in our proximity 
Otherwise, they will negatively influence us. Now, this is not the only time in the Torah that we are told about how we have to relate to the Canaanites. All the way back in Exodus, right after the Exodus, the nation was under the impression that the conquest was imminent. Of course, they ended up spending 40 years in the wilderness. But we were told that we cannot make treaties with the seven Canaanite nations. We cannot forge a pact, some sort of arrangement, some sort of agreement, some sort of mutual treaty with these nations. We cannot allow idolaters to endure to flourish in the land. And we're told in our parsha that when we engage in war, it must be total war, take no prisoners. And then there is the prohibition to refrain from total war against the Canaanites. Now, of course, these mitzvos are very difficult for modern sensibilities to be comfortable with. You know, we're trained in the ways of humane conduct in warfare. And there's a concern about the disproportionate use of force. And we struggle trying to understand how the Torah tells us to behave in such complete and tenacious fashion towards our Canaanite enemies. Now, of course, the Torah tells us that these people were were monstrous barbarians. They would engage in child sacrifice. This was a common occurrence in Canaan. And the Midrash tells us, actually, that while they were killing their children in barbarous fashion as some sort of offering to the gods, in order to drown out the shrieks of the children, they would have music in the background. These people were absolute barbarians. But still, the Jews are instructed to not abide by the Geneva Convention, and that is something that we have to wrestle with. Now, to get started, it's not clear that we must attack them without provocation. In fact, the Rambam tells us that even with regards to these seven Canaanite nations, we only wage war against them if they attack us. But regardless, there is an emphasis in Scripture about the intensity of the war against these seven nations. And I want to share, before we get started here, a few ideas about how we can understand the particular intensity that we are instructed to present towards our Canaanite enemies. The sources tell us that idolatry started with these Canaanite nations. They were the first nations to adopt idolatry. And of course, our national mission is to banish idolatry from the world, is to institute the Almighty, so to speak, as the king and the ruler over all, to make everyone aware of that, to create ubiquitous knowledge of God. And thus, we are complete antithetical enemies to these Canaanite nations. And perhaps this is also a reason why they're punished, that God tells us to treat them so harshly. We have to pursue them, and we have to uproot their noxious influence from the world. But I think there's some other points here that are helpful for us to understand what's happening over here. If you look at the history of the Jewish people, all the way back in antiquity and even until modern times, we repeatedly struggle with violence. When violence is called for, when it's justified, when it's appropriate, it's kind of against our nature. We're more merciful people. We're more pacifist, docile people. We're not trained, we're not schooled in the ways of violence. When Isaac felt Jacob, he said, the hands are the hands of Esau. That is the modus operandi of Esau. The voice is the voice of Jacob. And over the course of our history, we repeatedly erred by insufficient violence. In the war against Midian, featured at the end of the Book of Numbers, the leaders of the soldiers are excoriated by Moshe for not killing the females who were the causes of the war to begin with. We know that the first king of the Jews, Saul, 
who was head and shoulders above all of his peers and was the prototype of a great king, he was undone. He was forced to abdicate because he was instructed to kill Amalek and he didn't do a complete job. Even the Canaanites that we're told about in our Parsha, the books of Joshua and, and really the whole book of, of Judges are dealing with the fallout, with the aftermath, with the consequences of the blunder of not sufficiently uprooting the Canaanites from, from the land. Even today, you can make an argument that a lot of the troubles that Israel has experienced due to the hostile and violent Arab neighbors that are enmeshed in the land, some may argue that Israel had its chance in the various wars when they were triumphant over their Arab enemies, they could have mopped up, they could have cleaned house, they could have really cleared away a lot of these undesirable elements that later on kind of reared their ugly head and behaved in, in a very terroristic fashion. So we see throughout our history that we're just not good at violence. We're naturally a peaceful, merciful people. Violence is against our nature. And perhaps this is why we have to be reminded, hey, no, now it's appropriate. Now it's a mitzvah. You have to make sure you do a good job. Don't fall back, so to speak, on your nature and be more gentle and, and more kind and merciful. You have to learn to be violent. Now, there's another point over here that I want to I want to stress. In the aforementioned war against Midian, how many Jewish casualties were there? You know, if you had to estimate, you'd say we have a war, we have two sides, and you would evaluate the power and the, the defense lines and the materiel and the experience of the commanders, and you'd probably guess that there would be a certain a certain breakdown in, in casualties on either side. And the verse tells us, chapter 31 of the book of Numbers, verse 48, that there was not a single casualty. No dead, no injured. And the leaders, they came to Moshe and they gave some gold to the tabernacle as an appreciation for the fact that no one was killed. Even the most lopsided wars that we are familiar with, do not have 100% of the casualties on one side. So these are obviously not ordinary wars, the kinds of conflicts that we are accustomed to. It's a miraculous war. And it's really a war that's being waged by God. If it's 100% of the casualties on one side and 0% of the casualties on the side of the victor, obviously, there was some sort of supernatural force at play. And in fact, the Torah tells us in many places that the wars, both the previous wars against Egypt and against Amalek and against Ammon and Moab and against Midian and Bashan, etc., they were waged by God. And the upcoming wars against the Canaanites were told that there will be hornets spitting venom across the Jordan, and you'll surround the city of Jericho and blow the shofar, and the walls will be swallowed up by the ground. These wars are not ordinary human wars. And therefore, we have to view it in that context. This is God waging war, and we are the implement of God. And I think if it does raise a question, how do we understand the morality, if you will, of these wars, it's not a question you ask us, it's a question you have to ask God. And of course, we don't have the answer to that either, but the question of why God would destroy the city in war is the same question as why God would destroy the city of Pompeii with the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the year 79. Or why Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Or why pandemics happen. Or why tsunamis happen. Or why earthquakes happen. And therefore, I think it's, it's, a, it's a helpful framing to say, well, this is not the handiwork of humans as if we're making decisions. We're told by God what to do, but really God is the one who is 
implementing this conflict. And one final idea is that we have to accept the fact that the Torah does not believe in showing mercy to evil. These people, these Canaanites, they were the founders of the idolatrous way of life and all that came along with it. And this was profoundly evil. Again, it was common practice to engage in child sacrifice. We do not believe in leniency towards evil. The Midrash tells us that if you are merciful against cruel people, you will end up being cruel against the merciful. We give mercy to the merciful and we give cruelty to the cruel. And misplaced mercy and leniency is not appropriate. Evil must be stamped out. And when it does, we celebrate. So these are some ideas that we can use to to make the concept uh, of how we treat the Canaanites, the Canaanite policy, to make it a little bit more acceptable, so to speak, to our modern sensibilities. And uh, the Mitras tells us that Joshua offered terms. He offered peace terms to all the Canaanite nations. If you want to leave, that's fine. If you want to make peace, that's also fine. If you want to wage war, that too is an option. And all three choices were accepted by different groups. The nation of Girgashi, the Girgashite nation, which is one of the Canaanite nations, they said, we'll leave. They said, we we recognize that this land is created by God and he has selected you to have this land and to do what he wants you to do in this land. And therefore, we will vacate. And they left. The Gibbonites, they said, we'll make peace. They stayed. And 31 Canaanite kings waged war and were trounced. Now, as an aside, the Midrash tells us that the Girgashites, in a reward for their courageous and faithful decision to leave, they were awarded a comparable land. There's a land that's comparable to the land of Israel. And according to our tradition, it is the land of Morocco, which is a gorgeous country, I've been told. And it has many of the amenities of the Holy Land. They were given a land that in some way rivals or resembles the Holy Land. So the Torah tells us how we're supposed to treat the Canaanites. And here's the question I want to focus on today. What happens if a Canaanite converts? What if they say, I want to choose option D, I want to join the nation? So Rashi, to verse 18, he he notices a nuance in the verse, and he shares something very interesting with us. The verse tells us that we have to wage total war against the Canaanites, and we're given a reason in order that they don't teach us to behave the way they do, the abominable ways that they behave. The verse is telling us that the reason why we must be so aggressive towards the Canaanite nations is so that they don't teach us bad things. Now, Rashi is troubled with this verse. As we know, the Torah never tells us something that we would have otherwise known. The verse never tells us something that was patently obvious. The verse only tells us novel things. And Rashi is understanding this verse as saying that the reason why the Torah tells us the reason why the Canaanites must be so thoroughly rejected, it's to carve out an exception. There is an exception to the ordinary treatment of these nations. If one of them converts, then it doesn't apply. The only reason why they're banned is because they can serve as a harmful influence. That's what the verse says, so that they don't teach you to behave improperly. But if they convert, well, then those reasons don't apply. They could become part of our nation. And as a result, there is no 
longer the requirement to treat them as if they were a Canaanite. But there's, there, there, there's still a problem here. Rashi is indicating that the verse is telling us that if a Canaanite converts, we don't treat them like a Canaanite, instead we treat them like a fellow Jew. And thus we don't wage war against them. But here's the question. Isn't this obvious? Again, the verse only tells us something that we would not know otherwise. It has to be revealing something new to us. And this seems to be very obvious. If they convert and they become Jews, of course the laws of waging war against them would not apply. Who would ever consider otherwise? So it seems like we have a verse with an unnecessary lesson. The verse is giving us the reason for the Canaanite treatment, and Rashi explains this is coming to exclude a convert. Isn't that obvious? Of course, a convert is not treated like a Canaanite. And thus the verse is superfluous. What is the lesson of the verse? What is it teaching us? And this question is featured in many of the commentators. And I saw an incredible idea, courtesy of Maharal. He tells us that if the verse did not exist, then I would have thought that conversion does not change the status of the Canaanites. I have to treat someone like a Canaanite? No matter what, no matter what happens, no matter what they do, no matter if they repent or they convert, doesn't matter. Once a Canaanite, always a Canaanite. And he explains, the Canaanites are fundamentally corrupt. Of course, the first Canaanite was Canaan himself, a grandson of Noah. And he was cursed by Noah. So the very first Canaanite was cursed. And there's something rotten about this nation that seems to endure even as the generations pass. You recall in chapter 24 of Genesis, Abraham's trying to find a wife for his son Isaac. And he hires his trusty servant Eliezer, his right-hand man, his aide, to go find a wife for Isaac. And he makes him swear He makes him give an oath that he will not select a Canaanite woman to marry Isaac. And Rashi gives us the backstory. This is Rashi in Genesis 24, 39. Eliezer was a Canaanite and he had a daughter. And she was of marriageable age. And he really wanted to find a good husband for her. And who's a better husband than Isaac? And Abraham did not want this union to happen. And Abraham told Eliezer, my son is blessed. God said, I will bless those who bless you. I will bestow blessing upon you. But you are a Canaanite and Canaanites are cursed. And a blessed one and a cursed one do not mix. So even the greatest Canaanite, Abraham's trusted disciple, who he entrusted with a very vital mission, he is stained with the blemish of Canaan. There's something so deep-seated about the corruption of Canaan that it endures from generation to generation. And thus, Abraham makes him swear that he never considers marrying Isaac off to a Canaanite. I'd rather send him to the family of Laban and Basuel, who were idolaters, by the way. But there's something redeemable about them that I will not find amongst the Canaanites. So again, we see that this nation, there's something about them that is corrupt to the core. You may recall, perhaps, Leviticus chapter 18, when it lists all the abominations that are prohibited, the verse starts off, this is 18.3 of Leviticus, like the behavior of the Egyptians, And like the behavior of the Canaanites, do not behave. And Rashi there tells us that the worst 
of the worst, the nations that most embody these terrible behaviors are the Egyptians and the Canaanites. So this nation is a really corrupt nation. And says the Maharal, absent the verse, if the verse did not tell us that a Canaanite who converts and joins our nation has now been removed from the status of other Canaanites, if the verse did not tell me, I would have thought that even conversion does not help. I would have thought that a Canaanite who converts is still a Canaanite, and all the laws governing Canaanites would still apply. Absent the verse, I would have said that the curse of the Canaanites cannot be reversed. They are cursed, they are forever cursed, and nothing, not even conversion, can change that. That's what I would have said if we did not have the verse. But we do have the verse. And the verse tells us that if they do convert, then they are accepted. Conversion is able to undo all the negative influences of being a Canaanite. Yes, the mark of Canaan is very strong. The roots, the corrupted roots of Canaan run very deep. But even that can be flipped. Now, if you read the precise words of Rashi, you discover something stunning. The verse says, well, we have to get rid of these Canaanites that don't teach you bad things. Says Rashi, but if they repent and they convert, then you can accept them. Rashi does not say, but if they convert, you can accept them. He says, but if they repent and convert, then you may accept them. Now, we don't typically associate, we don't equate conversion with repentance. Repentance means you have to do something, and you didn't do it, you have to repent. If someone is a non-Jew, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing that you need to repent for. A non-Jew is not obligated to keep anything more than the seven Noahide laws. So the fact that Rashi tells us that a Canaanite who repents and converts can be accepted, that should get our attention. And the insight is, is that Rashi is explaining the meaning of the verse. Yes, the Canaanites are cursed. Yes, they are, together with the Egyptians, the most corrupt of nations. And yes, if I had not been told otherwise, I would have surmised that even conversion does not change the status of a Canaanite. But repentance is so powerful that it can burrow to the depths of a person's essence and clean it all out and cleanse it even from something as deep-rooted as the spiritual deficiencies of Canaanites. A Canaanite who repents and converts is welcomed into the nation. I think there are three very important takeaways from this idea. The first is this whole notion of deep-seated nature that is bequeathed from generation to generation. The Canaanites were cursed by Noah due to the dastardly behavior of Ham of Ham, the son of Noah. That was hundreds of years before the events of our parsha, before the nation's about to enter the land of Canaan. And absent a verse, if the verse did not tell me explicitly otherwise, I would have thought that that curse, that that corruption is so permanent, is so unshakable, nothing can undo it. The behavior, the, the roots of the antecedents get so deeply ingrained and embedded that it's manifested years later, generations later, by their descendants. In next week's Parsha, we're going to read about the Ammonite and the Moabite nations. And we're told that even if they do convert, they cannot intermarry amongst the Jewish people. And 
that applies by male converts, not by female converts. Of course, we know there was a very famous female Moabite convert, Ruth, the great-grandmother of David. So the female Moabite and Ammonite converts are allowed to intermarry amongst the nation. But the males are not. Why? Because these nations displayed a lack of kindness and hospitality and appreciation and gratitude. Now, why would the behavior of the previous generations, why would that matter? It's the same principle. When people can display behavior that's so thoroughly antithetical to our nation, it's so unkind and un hospitable, inhospitable. It displays such ingratitude and we see that in such in such a strong way. That is enough to say that their descendants will have that quality as well and we don't want any of those genes anywhere near our nation and they are permanently barred from entering and intermarrying amongst our people. Now it is interesting but there's a difference between the Canaanites and the Ammonites and the Moabites. The Canaanites, the verse does tell us that they're allowed to intermarry amongst the nation. If they repent, if they convert, they can join. Whereas the Ammonites and the Moabites, even if they do convert, they cannot join. What's the difference? How come the Canaanites are allowed to join, but the Ammonites and Moabites are not? Perhaps the answer is, that these nations both have corruption, but in different domains. The Canaanites, it's all sorts of abominable behavior. It's idolatry, it's all sorts of sexual perversion. But that is more tolerable than the Ammonites and the Moabites, who display a lack of kindness, a lack of hospitality, a lack of positive interaction with other people. When Abraham sent Eliezer to go inspect a potential spouse for Isaac, what was he looking for? He was looking for kindness. He said, if there's a woman, if there's a girl, and she offers me water and and also the camel's water without even being told to do so, then she is worthy of joining the empire of kindness of Abraham. And yes, the family of Rebecca were idolaters, but somehow that was not a concern. That's more solvable than the lack of interpersonal kindness. And thus, the corruption of the Canaanites, yes, it was deep-seated, but it was more solvable. It could be fixed, it could be rectified if they convert, if they repent. It's much easier for it to be undone and removed than the corruption of the Ammonites and the Moabites. But there's a principle that bad character gets bequeathed from generation to generation. And there's a concern that those noxious forces can potentially corrupt the character of our nation and dampen and weaken and diminish the spirit of Abraham. Now, there's a good version of this as well. Just as bad character can be transmitted from generation to generation, good character, positive attributes can also be transmitted from generation to generation. You know, we claim that we're special. We claim that we are the chosen nation. Why? Why do we think that we're special? Why do we claim to be the chosen nation? Are we better? What have we done to earn that designation? A child at eight days old, by the circumcision, they forge a bond of closeness as if they are a beloved one, a cherished one of God. They haven't done anything to earn that. The answer is this idea. We're not better because of our own behavior. We're better because we are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And their greatness, their achievements, their closeness to the Almighty was bequeathed to us. We have the Y chromosome of Abraham. There's something about Abraham that still exists within every person. Why? Every Jew, that is. Why? 
because that is the power of character. It gets perpetuated from generation to generation. In chapter 5 of the book of the Ethics of Our Fathers, we read in subsequent teachings two things about Abraham. In the first, we're told that there are ten generations from Noah to Abraham. If you look at the end of Parshas Noah, we read the ten generations from Noah to Abraham. In the very next Mishnah, we're told that there are ten tests that Abraham, our forefather, was tested, and he withstood, he triumphed in all of them. If you notice, perhaps, there is a name change. When it talks about Abraham's genealogy, he is ten generations from Noah. It just calls him Abraham. When it talks about Abraham's ten tests, it calls him Abraham, our forefather. Why? The shift. And there's a very famous piece in Ruach Chaim from Reb Chaim Velazhner, where he says that with respect to Abraham's ten tests, he is our father. In those spiritual triumphs, he acquired traits that became part of the gene pool of the genes that he bestowed, that he bequeathed to his future descendants. And thus we inherited those qualities. One of Abraham's tests were to give up his life for God. Nimrod, the Babylonian king, said, bow down to me or else I throw into the fire. And Abraham says, throw me in. And of course, a miracle happened and Abraham survived. But we see that Abraham's test included a challenge of martyrdom. And our nation throughout our history, we've displayed martyrdom in almost every, or probably in every generation. And Jews seem ready to forfeit their lives for God. Where does that come from? Where is our association, our affinity with martyrdom come from? It comes from Abraham, our forefather. God tells Abraham, go to the land of Israel. Go to the land of Canaan. And he does it. And doesn't think about all the consequences and what's going to be and how am I going to survive. That quality of giving up everything and just going to the land, which has been demonstrated, which has been displayed throughout the generations and centuries amongst our people, that comes from Abraham and so on. And he quotes a verse in Proverbs, a righteous person who goes with wholesomeness, praiseworthy are his sons after him. The children inherit the qualities and the achievements of their forebearer, of their progenitor. It becomes embedded in whatever they convey, whatever they perpetuate to their descendants. The Talmud tells us that there are three qualities of our nation. We are merciful, we are bashful, and we're kind. And these three qualities we inherited from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Kindness from Abraham, bashfulness from Isaac, and mercy from Jacob. And this is a very important idea. If you think about it, our life quest is one of improvement. We want to improve. We want to refine ourselves. We want to elevate ourselves. We want to transform ourselves. And we want to take our flaws and fix them and take our qualities and burnish them and develop them. But this is not something that lives and dies with us. Our qualities endure. Our flaws as well endure. And they can be perpetuated to our children. Someone who works on developing themselves, on improving themselves, it will manifest in their children. Some of the sages present this in a physiological way. They talk about how there's a certain chemical balance that causes certain characteristics to be present and to surface. And if you work on it, if you work on overcoming your anger, then the 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 red, so to speak, secretion gets diminished, and that gets part of the DNA that gets transmitted onwards. It's almost like spiritual epigenetics. And thus, point number two is that this really creates an imperative for us to both preserve the qualities that we inherited 
and also to rectify our flaws. Because whatever we do, that gets bequeathed to our children, to our future generations. A responsible parent, of course, they won't smoke, they won't drink, they won't do drugs, God forbid, when they're pregnant. Along these lines, we now know how important it is to not do things that harm our children's spiritual lives as well. The more righteous, the more elevated, the more refined that we become, that will be translated to our children as well. And more broadly, if you think about it, you know, we have the qualities of Abraham. And Abraham started the grand initiative of the world, and it's our responsibility to finish it. And the whole world, the success and or failure of the world is up to us. We are the guardians of the galaxy. And if we mess it up, if we corrupt ourselves, if we repudiate the mission of Abraham, then we're severing ourselves, of course, from Abraham, but also we have this responsibility. And we're responsible for it, and our children are responsible for it as well. And the further, God forbid, if we were to get further away from our mission, it's going to cascade outwardly as well to those around us and to our future generations. And finally, the third idea is the power of repentance. The verse has to tell us something that we didn't know otherwise. If we didn't have the verse, we would say that the Canaanites, those flaws are so hardwired, they cannot be reversed. But we do have a verse. And the verse says that the only people who are included in this Canaanite policy are those who did not repent and did not convert. But it shows us the power of repentance. No one is beyond rectification and reclamation. Nothing is irreconcilably broken. And I think this is a helpful lesson as we embark on the month of repentance, the month of Elul. This is the month that we prepare, of course, for the high holidays, for Rosh Hashanah, for Yom Kippur, and for repentance. And now we have a lesson. If the Canaanites, the most corrupt of all nations, if they are not beyond salvation, if repentance is strong enough to pull them back in, well, neither are we. We are not beyond salvation. And with repentance, we too can be pulled back in. We'd like to end the podcast with a question, and the question orients around the strange conscription method featured in our Parsha. In chapter 20, verses 5 through 8, we read about who we select to go to war. And the officers say, who is the man who built a house but didn't live in it? Go back home. Who is the man who planted a vineyard but did not enjoy the fruits? Go back home. Who is the man who betrothed a woman but did not marry her, did not consummate the marriage? Go back home. And who is the man who is fearful and whose heart is weak? Go back home and do not weaken the spirit of your brethren. Now, who are these people who are exempt? Who are these people who have weakness of heart, who are fearful? So there's a very interesting comment in Rashi. This is 28, 20 verse 8. Rashi cites two opinions from the Mishnahic era as to what exactly it means that someone is fearful and weak-hearted. So Rashi first cites the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. What does it mean to be fearful? You're scared of war. There's, there's the shrieks, the battle cries, there's the, all the animals, the saber rattling, and all the noise, and all the explosions. Some people just don't have the ability, the temperament to deal with that. And those people are exempt from military duty. That is the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. Comes along Rabbi Haglili, and he says, no, fearful? Not fearful from the emotional rigors of war, but someone who's fearful because of the sins that they have. 
And then Rabbi Yosef Galili says, listen to this. The only people we don't want partaking in the war, it's only the sinners. This, after all, is a war that's going to be overseen by God. It's a miraculous war. We cannot have sinners. If there's a sinner, there won't be a miracle. But we don't make an announcement. Uh, hey, all, all sinners, please leave because, you know, that's embarrassing. So we want to provide some cover for the sinners. We want to allow them to save face and allow them to leave because we don't want them there. So we say, oh, you build a house or you plant a vineyard or you betray the woman or, you, or you're a sinner. And all the people who leave, you have some uh, plausible deniability. You say, well, I, I built a house or, so you know, I betrayed the woman or planted a vineyard. To provide cover for the sinners, we have all those other people who are exempt with a half-built house, unconsummated marriage, or vineyard, etc. That's what is featured in Rashi. But here's the question. Why, according to the other opinion, who's not worried about sinners, who says those who are uh, fearful, it means, you know, literal, emotional, trauma, fear of, of war. According to that opinion, why do we send away people who built a house or betrothed a woman or planted a vineyard? Why are those people exempt? If it's to provide cover for the sinners, I get it. But if we're not worried about the sinners, why are those people exempt? And again, the Maharal says something wonderful. Maharal is quickly becoming one of our favorite commentators here on the Parsha podcast. He tells us that unfinished business is dangerous. If you don't start something, that's okay. If you finish something, that's marvelous. But between the point where you start a project and the point when you end it, it doesn't matter what kind of project it is. It could be the betrothal of a woman, the building of a house, the planting of a vineyard. From when you start something until when you finish it, there is danger. There are forces that arise that will try to prevent the consummation of any project, and that creates danger. And you don't want to compound that danger with the danger of war. And therefore, someone who plants a vineyard but doesn't doesn't enjoy, hasn't finished it, builds a house, betrothes a woman, that person's in danger. And if you put them in a setting of danger, they may die. It won't end up well. And therefore, there is an independent reason why people who are in the middle of a project should not be placed into a dangerous situation. And that's why they're exempt from military service. I think there's a, there's a beautiful lesson over here. When you start a project, you are embarking on a dangerous venture. Why? Because the Almighty created in the world forces that try to stand in the way of people, that create barriers, that create obstacles, preventing people from accomplishing great things. As an example, the Maharal brings the sources that tell us that there was a very specific point in time when the nation did the sin of the golden calf. Precisely at the point when God was handing the tablets to Moshe, and the tablets, they're, they're six handbreaths wide, and two handbreaths were in, in the hands of God, and two in Moshe, and two in the middle, at precisely this time, in middle, so to speak, of the conveyance, of the transference of the tablets, that's when the Satan arose, and that's when the Satan impelled the nation to commit the sin of the golden calf. Between the starting point and the end point of this project of giving over the tablets, that's when there was the most danger, and that's when the Satan arose to coax and goad the nation into sin. And by the way, the final verse in the Torah talks about Moshe's strong hand. That's a reference, our sages tell us, to what happened afterwards. The nation does the sin of the golden calf. And then God says, okay, well, you have no rights to have the tablets. And God, so to speak, pulls the tablets away from Moshe. And Moshe pulls the tablets away from God. And who won that tug of war? Moshe. And thus the Torah lauds Moshe for the strong hand, so to speak, whatever that means. Of course, it's not literal. We don't know exactly what this means. 
And of course, it raises the question, if Moshe is going to work so hard to get the tablets, why does he shatter them? A separate question. But the point of danger, the most concentrated point of danger, is between the starting point and the end point of any project. And therefore, someone who is in danger, you don't place them into further danger because that is really dangerous for this person. My grandfather, a blessed memory, would point to the Mishnah at the end of chapter 5 of the chapters of the fathers that it sorts us to be bold like a leopard and light like an eagle and swift like a deer and mighty like a lion to do the will of God, our Father in heaven. This is a project. You want to start a project, my grandfather, the blessed memory used to say? You start it off with boldness. You have to have some sort of irrational confidence. And then when you want to husband the project forward, you need to have the lightness, the aerial gliding power of an eagle to fly over all the difficulties. You have to be swift like a deer. You can't sit around. And to finish it, you have to be mighty like a lion. If you're slow, if you're lumbering, if you're indecisive, that's it. You're in danger. You have to realize that now you are vulnerable. This is how you finish a project because projects face resistance. And that resistance, we're told by the Maharal, it's a sort of danger. And when someone's in danger, you don't put them into danger. I think it's a very powerful idea, a very important idea of what it takes to bring a project to fruition. I thank you for listening to this edition of the Parsha Podcast. This was a joy and a delight. I apologize for it being a bit late. I'm glad we got it out. Again, visit torchsurvey.com or click the link in the description to chime in on what's happening here at Torch. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a terrific rest of your week. A sensational, uplifting, invigorating, and inspiring Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week.